Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we continue our study and segue into and back into the book of Daniel, shall we ask our Heavenly Father now for his guidance so that we may more completely understand that which is being presented before us for this time. Shall we now pray? Gracious Father in heaven, as we look to open your word of truth, help us now that we may rightly divide the word of truth, that we may be guided in the steps that you would have us to take, so that we may walk in the path that you would have us to walk at this time. I thank you for each one that is attending this meeting. Help us as we comment, as we discuss, so that we may remind ourselves that your angels, your spirit, and you are watching everything that is going on. We pray for your forgiveness of our sins. <clears throat> we pray for your blessing upon this meeting, for your direction, so that we may be found worthy to walk with you in the courts to come. May your angels surround us. May your spirit enlighten us. To this end, we ask, we pray, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. From the close of our meeting yesterday, we have the Review and Herald article that Smith presented for publish on the 20th December of 1870. Now, this is one of those times where the months on the rabbinic year and the Islamic year all lined up with the same date which was the 26th day of the ninth month. So this also was one of the articles that had been delayed in publishment. So we come to this in the first verse. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing, and he had understanding of the vision. Now, as we have looked at this in the past, when we're looking at this vision, we are looking here, not at the calzone, but at the mare. And the mare was given a couple of other descriptive names, one of which was the vision which is true. Yeah, and thanks, thanks for, so, for um, doing what, so thanks, thanks Smith, for doing this. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so, so thanks for doing this study, because uh, this is uh, what I wanted to do, and I appreciate you putting this together. Now, um, so when we went through this before, so just to kind of remind us, um, you know, we address the chronology of when this is. This is the third year of Cyrus. And um, so he's going to try to address this as well. And then we know that the thing that was true, so we have in in Hebrew. Now, he's not going to address that, um, I don't think, uh, that it's the debar. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, so I'm just going to this in my Bible. Right. So the the thing was revealed. You're speaking of so Hebrew six nine seven. Yeah. So so first it's it's gonna say the thing was revealed unto Daniel. So that means the Debar is is revealed unto Daniel. Now, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel. That's a Debar whose name was called Belteshazzar. Obviously, that's referring to Daniel, not the thing. And then it says the thing was true. So that is, again, the Debar. But the time appointed was long. Now, it's unfortunate that the King James translates this time appointed because it really means the controversy was great. And then it says, and he understood the thing, so the Debar, and had understanding of the vision. That vision is the vision of the evenings and mornings, right? The Mara. So, okay. 
So, so that's just not generally, you know, people don't usually look at that. They just kind of read what it says. But, but there's a lot in that, that first sentence. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out what we had looked at. We think that the purpose of this vision actually is, as you're, which is not really given fully until verse 14, where it says, now I'm come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the kazon is for many days, the kazon vision is for many days. So the whole purpose is to put this all together. He has understanding of the matter or the thing, pardon me, and the thing is Daniel chapter 9. The, the vision is Daniel chapter 8. So he understands Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9. He understands the seven weeks and the 2300 days. But he hasn't put it all together. Well, with the, <clears throat> since yeah. you bring this up, yeah, this word that is being used in the phrase, the, but the time appointed, mm -hmm. so law, Hebrews 6635. Yeah. So a mass of persons or figurative things, especially regularly organized for war, an army, by implication, a campaign or figuratively, mm -hmm. specifically, hardship or worship. So mm -hmm. it is interesting, especially given, you know, several other points that we've been addressing, because this has more than just what the, the phrase in the English would have us to understand. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's kind of strange to translate that whole phrase as the time of point it was long. Uh, because we have other words that are translated as time appointed. And so translating the King James to time appointed, I would naturally have thought that they're talking about uh, the Moed, because that's translated as time appointed as well in this chapter um, and other places in Daniel. And then and Gadol, which is normally translated great, it wouldn't make sense to translate this as long. So... And it says great in any sense, but you would need something, you would need it to be great if there's definitely a period that's being talked about, right? If you're going to use time appointed, it's, it's never a period of time. It's, it's a point of time, if anything, right? If you're going to have it as, you know, so, so it'd be much more that the conflict was great or the controversy was great. But it's also interesting that because this word thing is being repeated, where well, yeah, well, it is being repeated, but it's 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 part of the topic of what's being done because you know, so I, I don't know it's not it's not like a doubling. I mean it's i I didn't think it was a doubling. yeah, I'm just finding an emphasis, yeah. So yeah, I, I find it odd that they translate it as thing, though, right? Because you know that word is in uh, chapter nine when you're going to um, look at you know sort of the context of what we've just been presented. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. That word commandment is debar, right? Right. So. So, you know, I would much more readily have translated it. Well, it's it, it's like uh, this. If we if we yeah. make an application that the commandment was stable. So this is giving us this debar is pointing us even further to the correctness and the stability of the 2300 days. Where, where are you getting stability? You take a look at uh, Hebrew 571, contracted from Hebrew 5. Oh, true. Emmet. Okay, you're talking about the word Emmet. True. Yes. Is that? Yeah, I mean, it comes from the word stability more, more in the sense of a foundational, um, in that sense. When it talks about stability, it, it's, it's, it, it's something right. that's like a foundation that provides because uh, we think of the word stability in a little bit different. I mean, 
like when we think of something that's stable or it, it's just the meaning of the word has changed over time from the obvious fact that something that's stable is because it's fixed right it's it's fixed into a foundation does that make sense good so it's so it's assured it's trustworthy it's stable a ladder that's stable you know is not going to tip over right right because it, it's it's fixed so if you have a ladder that's not fixed it would not be stable even if you know even if you're you're climbing it and it seems sort of stable it's not fixed <laughs> it could tip over if you're not careful but you might have to have somebody hold it for you so I, I, and I just think of ladders because we were using a ladder the other day, and I never trust So in ladders. this, we're establishing that this is in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. And a thing, a debar, was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the debar was stable, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the debar and had understanding of the vision. Now, Pruitt yesterday was making a, a very fallacious comment that Daniel could not have had a reference or even a thought of a 2520. And the sad thing is that the, the same situation here, because of the understanding of the vision of the Mare, is not that much different. I mean, Daniel has come to the end of the 70-year period, and now here he is having to consider that, that there's yet 2,300 years. So many of Pruitt's arguments against the seven times have been summarily laid to rest. And we're going to take a look here as to what Uriah Smith, who... Pruitt holds up as being so wise has had to say. So yeah, Smith, and go ahead. yeah, and so I mean we're going to see the mistake that uh, you know, Smith makes with the chronology, which really kind of weakens the whole point of Daniel chapter ten. But um, we also know that in um, what was I going to say now? In in um, nine eleven, so Daniel nine eleven. He right. is going to right. reference the oath written in the Law of Moses, which, of course, is Leviticus 26. Right. And he's concerned about the 70 years, which Pruitt already has said is connected to Leviticus 26. So um, now, of course, Pruitt's understanding of the 2520 is, is very limited. He, he doesn't understand you know, the fulfillment of Leviticus 26 for literal Israel, the four seven times. So, and he doesn't understand its connection to the 2300 days by, by the three decrees. So since he doesn't understand that, it's he, he's not going to understand <laughs> that Daniel is concerned about uh, the 2520. But anyway, it's, it, yeah, it's a piece of information, though, he should have been able to figure out. It's like he's got so close, but there's just this, the thing is he's attacking something in his mind, using the Bible to do that. And one of the things, you know, I was thinking about is how, um, somebody wrote a comment on a YouTube video about Earth, you know, where he's, he's trying to say, you know, should I even watch your videos because and I'm not sure why somebody doesn't just watch them and figure it out for themselves. But uh, let me see here. Where's this? Yeah, so what is he first? You know, he's he's trying to basically say, okay, I'll read it. Uh, does, uh, so I, I refer him to, to answer his question, to the Telford News uh, Prophecy Conference uh, videos. And then he asks the question, does that series blend prophecy with the prophetic necessity and application of the commandments and faith of Yeshua, or is it a majority theoretical lecturing, which I'm not really sure 
what he means about that. And then he's going to respond. Now, I don't know if this is a different person, so let me see here. There's the rest of the state. Oh, I see a lot. I'm looking at the wrong spot here. So, yeah, and then he's going to say, and he says, um, I'm asking, yeah, I don't know if it's the same person. Anyway, he says, I'm asking if the series technical application is mostly, is mostly theoretical. There's some point in temple of that issue, lest there be a part religion and works of righteousness, and it be all head knowledge. And I um, so explain that, you know, we're looking at the truth. We need to apply it ourselves. It's not so much what's being presented as the issue to give us very prophecy quote. And it's just that we have to take things and uh, we have to bring them into the inner temple, right? When people just spend things from a theoretical point of view. So it's not so much on speaking side of it. What we do with what we're studying. But I bring this up just because there is there is at least in my opinion, an underlying a current in his question that that I've seen many times. I'm not trying to carry the end, but I've run into lots of people who, when something is difficult or hard to understand and requires a great deal of work, they will perceive this as a theoretical, right? And that is, um, and many of these people, and I'm not saying this about this brother, but many of these people are people who consider themselves to be very spiritual, but rarely reflect Christ's character in how they deal with others. That is, they tend to be uh, self-righteous. Now, it's hard for me to judge a person's heart, uh, but they're the type of people who believe, and I know people like this, that they're being so very, very spiritual in this approach. But it's just that they're, they're spiritually lazy. They don't like anything that's going to challenge them intellectually. So whether he's, this is the case or not with him, I don't know. But, um, and, and they're so ready to condemn others who are not as spiritual as them. And we probably all know people like that. They're, they're not going to listen to anyone. They're not going to take the time to understand what someone else is saying because you know, it's just a bunch of head knowledge, right? Now, and I say that too in this context here, because of talking about Pruitt's argument that that I consider that sometimes there are people who the reason, and I'm, again, I'm not saying this about Eugene Pruitt, I don't know his heart, but there are people in that opposite sense, so there's the people that are really lazy, then there are people who they will study, but they may study to tear down others. And I get accused of this sometimes because when somebody's studious and they tend to correct people, so in the sense we're correcting Eugene Pruitt, a person could think, oh, you're just argumentative, right? It is. Uh, the only reason you guys are studying this stuff is because you're trying to tear down other people. And of course, that's not the purpose of studying God's word or pointing out that someone's in error because the purpose of studying the Bible is for ourselves to be corrected, not just intellectually, but spiritually. And the whole purpose of all of our studies here has to do with the the great conflict, the great controversy, right? This this issue that has been going on and our part to play in end time events. So there's not much I can do about other people's attitudes about things. I can do something about my own attitude. But when I say that I'm disappointed with Eugene Pruitt's approach, it seems to be more polemical. That is, it seems to be more argumentative. And it could appear to somebody watching these videos that, that we're being argumentative. But I think we're trying to be very open and look at things uh, as closely and as carefully as we can. So, 
you know, it's just it, it's just so disappointing when somebody comes so close to the truth. But the reason, at least from my perspective, of why he hasn't he didn't go further is because he's satisfied enough that he is right and someone else is wrong. And we have to really question what do I really know? What do I really understand? We can't be satisfied with the, our understanding of God's word. We must dig deeper. No disagreement. Now, again, Smith continues, this verse introduces us to the last of the recorded visions of the prophet Daniel. The instruction imparted to him at this time being continued through chapters 11 and 12 to the close of the book. The third year of Cyrus was B.C. 534. Twenty-one years had consequently elapsed since Daniel's vision of the four beasts in the first year of Belshazzar, 555. Nineteen years since the vision of the ram, the he-goat, little horn, and the 2300 days of chapter 8. In the third year of Belshazzar, 553. And four years okay. since the instruction I, given to Daniel respecting the 70 weeks in the first year of Darius, B.C. 538, as recorded in chapter 9. Okay, yeah. So it's kind of interesting. He is correct that this vision occurs, you know, there's the 21 and the 19. So the, not, the thing is he has the wrong date for the first year of Belshazzar. Or... I'm just trying to look this up here. So I did work this out. So this 19 and 21 is the same dates, the same numbers that I arrived at. Right. But I didn't start with the date that he did, and I didn't end with the date that he did. So that is, he's taking this as, as 534 BC, because he's going to count the third year of Cyrus from when Cyrus is third year would have begun if and when cyrus is what well cyrus's third year would have begun if his first year in this count is counted from uh 536 right but this count here in the third year of cyrus is going to be counting it from uh 530 well it's actually a counting it ordinal count or whatever from all the babylon Right, not from the death of of Darius the Mede. So, so it's something that we establish that this third year here is 536. Right. So he's now we know that it says in Daniel chapter one in verse uh, 21, and Daniel continued even unto the first year of King of King of first year of King Cyrus. So if this is the third year of Cyrus, then Daniel can't possibly be here. He dropped out again. Yeah. If if this yeah, so if this is the third year of Cyrus in in the context of being five thirty four, then Daniel continued not to the first year of King Cyrus, but to the third year of King Cyrus. Right. right. So obviously that that third year here must be the first year of King Cyrus. That makes sense? So it must be his if first that, year as the sole monarch? Yes. Okay. Right. And that's not, yeah, exactly. So because Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus, and there's no way you could flip it around and say, well, you know, any other way. The only way that you could can take this is that this third year in chapter 10 is the third year from the first year of Darius the Mede, right? So, which is going to be mentioned in, in chapter 11, verse 1. Um, but also, it wouldn't really make sense for Daniel to have this vision after the decree of Cyrus has already been issued two years earlier, because the question would be, what's going on here you know what why why is there why is cyrus's heart being worked upon uh much more it makes much more sense to put it in what daniel and other places calls the first year of cyrus 
um, because then he's going to issue the decree. So it fits into there. It doesn't fit in 534. But the point is, these 19 and 21 years are still uh, important. And the 21 years uh, uh, speaks to the 21 days that he's going to be in prayer from when he begins to when the angel comes to him. And so I believe that the 21 days represents the 21 years from the vision of um, Daniel chapter 8. Okay. So Smith Smith continues. On the overflow of the kingdom of Babylon by the Medes and the Persians, B.C. 538, Darius, through the courtesy of his nephew Cyrus, was permitted to occupy the throne. This he did till the time of his death, about two years after. About this time, Cambyses, king of Persia, the father of Cyrus, having also died, Cyrus became the sole monarch of the second universal empire of prophecy, B.C. 536. This being reckoned as his first year, his third year, in which his vision was given to Daniel, would be B.C. 534. The death of Daniel is supposed to have occurred soon after this, he being at this time, according to Prido, not less than 91 years of age. So in this situation, Smith is again making use of one of the commentaries that he does very greatly value. So we're addressing... Prido is actually more uh, deals with chronology than just the commentary, but... Okay. Yeah, so he's using a chronologist here. But anyway, it, so it's not really just a commentary. He's, he's tr- because Prideau is always going to be addressing chron- chronological issues in the Bible. But we are looking then at this occurring more in 536 than we would in 534, correct? Well, if Daniel chapter 1, verse 21 is true. Yeah, it has to be 536, the first year of Cyrus. Now, the question is, why is Daniel, who wrote the book of Daniel, why is he referring to this as the third year of Cyrus? Well, I think it would have to do with the context of dealing with the fall of Babylon. Right. Um, So, because that's going to be mentioned at the beginning of chapter 11. So, and so it's more as Cyrus as the general. Who is, who is involved in the fall of Babylon, where his uncle, Darius the Mede, um, Gabriel was also there in, in the decisions that were made back with Darius the Mede as far as, um, you know, what was going to happen with the fall of Babylon. So there's, you know, so these are all tied together. But we can see that, you know, Cyrus, if we count his reign, I mean, he's been reigning for a long time already as the king of Persia, but he's he's just not the sole king of Persia. And so, you know, really he has three different ways you can count his reign. You can just count his reign when he first becomes king of Persia, which is a lot, many, many years before. I can't remember how many years now, but a long time before. And then you could count his reign as it is here from when he becomes king of lands uh, with uh, the fall of Babylon, or you could count it when he actually becomes the king, the king of the, the sole uh, king of the entire realm with the death of Darius the Mede. Yeah. So in, in this case, Daniel is referring to what he calls the first year in chapter one as the third year. And, and that creates confusion for people. I actually had this discussion with Brittany uh, in an email discussion over a long period of time where she she tried to argue this. But in looking at everything, it has to be what is called the first year in chapter 1, verse 21. Because otherwise, chapter 1, verse 21, it, it would be wrong. It would have to say Daniel continued even unto the third year of King Cyrus. Because... He's obviously continuing, you know, here until, so I, I don't know. I mean, unless you're going to say the first year of um, 
and and yeah, so it just doesn't make sense. You know, one thing you could argue, I guess, is to be consistent. I just thought of this now because he's going to be the king of Bab, like Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon, and we could say that the Daniel is continuing to be this counselor to the king of Babylon until the first year of King Cyrus. And the first year of King Cyrus then is being counted, not from 536, but from when Babylon falls. That might actually be uh, the best way to explain that. Does, does that make sense? I'm <clears throat> Some of what you said dropped out. Okay. So in Daniel 1 verse 21, he's going to be the counselor for Nebuchadnezzar, right? Right. But he, he's going to continue to be a counselor. He's going to be continue to be one of uh, the Chaldeans, so to speak, right? He's going to be this, this counselor. He's basically uh, a policy analyst for the king of Babylon, right? And, and it says, and Daniel continued even unto the first year of the king Cyrus. Well, when Cyrus comes and conquers Babylon, that could be what's being referred to as the first year of King Cyrus when Babylon falls. Now, it's going okay. to tell us that Darius the Mede took the kingdom, right, even though Cyrus is the general. So, so that is another possibility that the first year of King Cyrus is not showing the end of when Daniel lives, but to the end of when he is the counselor for the king of Babylon. But but I don't know. So that, that's just another option of how we could read Daniel 1, verse 21. So that means he's going to continue uh, because of this, this time it's going to be um, uh, when he stands before the king is going to be two years after he's taken captive, right? And then he's going to continue until the fall of Babylon, 66 years later. It could be saying that. Okay. So that that would make it consistent that Daniel would be using the count first year and third year, both in reference to the fall of Babylon, which Smith isn't doing that. He's he's taking okay. it. When Cyrus comes to the throne at the death of Darius the count. But either way, it, it's going to make it 536 BC. Daniel chapter 10 is 536 BC. Okay. Scripture continues. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. The marginal reading for three full weeks is weeks of days, which term Dr. Stonard thinks is here used to distinguish the time spoken of from the weeks of years brought to view in the preceding chapter. So here Smith is making the application that these 21 days are tied with the 21 years between the visions. Would we agree? Or would we agree? No, that's not what he's saying. Okay. No, it, it, what he's talking about is what Dr. Stonard is saying, is the reason why he calls it weeks of days is because we had the 70 weeks of years earlier in chapter 9. And so it's, it's just to distinguish that this is not uh, weeks of years, that Daniel wasn't fasting for uh, 21 years. Okay. But... but <laughs> But I, I don't think that it's just the normal Hebrew way of expressing weeks, weeks of days. I mean, but, but you know, there could be some ways in which he's, he's trying to clarify that. I don't know. Um, you would have to look at lots of other places where we talk about weeks. But it's common to talk about his weeks of days. Yeah. I, but, but definitely Uriah Smith is not equating the 21 years as being typified by the 21 days. But I, I do think that it is typifying it, that the 21 years and the 21 days are connected because 
it's the zone that that is being explained that part of vision of Daniel chapter 8 that 21 years before he didn't understand right that's the part that he didn't really grasp right so that part is going to be because now later chapter 9 is going to explain that okay uh, the the mara is going to be explained but still he doesn't fully understand the zone so if that makes sense but but yeah he's not he's not, Uriah Smith is making. For what purpose did this aged servant of God thus humble himself and afflict his soul? Evidently for the purpose of understanding more fully the divine purpose concerning events that were to befall the church of God in coming time. For the divine messenger sent to instruct him says, From the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand, and The rest follows to verse 12. There was then still something which Daniel did not understand, but in reference to which he earnestly desired light. What was it? It was undoubtedly some part of his last preceding visions, namely the vision of chapter 9, and through that of the vision of chapter 8, of which chapter 9 is but a further explanation. And as the result of his supplication, he now receives more minute information respecting the events included in the great outlines of his former visions. Yeah, so if Uriah Smith had understood that it's the 2520, basically, that needs to be explained, you know, because he already understands the Debar, chapter 9, and he already understands the Marat, chapter 8, right? But there is connected to chapter 8 and chapter 9, this other period, the 2520, that Daniel now is going to be given more explicit instruction in. And we're going to see that, of course, in chapter 12, which we already studied, um, that the, the scattering of the power of the holy people and then the 1290 and the 1335 that's going to help us in understanding help Daniel in understanding the whole scope of the vision so Uri Smith almost gets it right here okay kind of reminds me of Eugene Pruitt you know studying Leviticus 26 but not seeing the four seven times uh, it's like Uri Smith here he, he's right but if he understood the 2520 he would see He's missing the mark. He's just, he's almost there, but not quite. Well, it's interesting because if Smith had set aside his prejudice of the understanding of Leviticus 26, how many of these other details of the visions would have been open to him? Yeah. And, and I still say that, that he's not so much. I mean, obviously, there's personal prejudice that exists in your eyes, Smith. But I still believe that the truth was hidden. That, that you know, in I mean, I'm not saying that your eyes, Smith, doesn't have a fault in that. But um, in some ways, I don't think that he could have seen it. I mean, if he did, our history would be completely different. So, so the 1863 chart has hidden in the top right-hand corner the 2520 in the prophetic mirror right god's hand was over the top corner so we're not looking here for a moral fault fault because he doesn't quite see it and i'm not even really doing that with eugene pruitt even though i believe it is the time that we should understand these things i think there is there's always fault when we don't see truth um and and eugene pruitt would maybe have less of an excuse than uriah smith because I believe it has been open. So Eugene Pruitt could have been a part of the opening, the understanding of Leviticus 26 back in 2009. Um, but instead, we, we bring in these controversies with man, and those things cause our blindness. Um, I was watching a video, um, it's pretty interesting, where this um, uh, 
this guy goes through uh, what, uh, why we, it, well, basically it's a scientific study of why we have confirmation bias, why we tend to believe things, why information gets through um, sort of unexamined uh, by our conscious mind. Some information gets through. He uses an illustration of bricks that gets through, but why we just accept some things when we hear them, we don't really examine them. And, and that's because those things that we hear fit into the pieces of the puzzle we already have. And we get a dopamine hit when, when something like that happens, especially when it's, it's emotionally charged and has to do with conflicts with others, so with our tribe. So that party spirit that sometimes uh, that it, it really is a motivator of why we accept something and don't accept something else, and that we're not objective at all in, in those instances. And uh, then why other things that, of course, are not part of our worldview that may disagree with us, agree with what we think, that we also have an emotional reason to reject those things. And uh, so that most emotional aspect of information, uh, we often don't consider. Um, and some people are much more emotional about information than others. That is, some people have more of a party spirit than others. But I think in Eugene Pruitt's case, that would be the fault is that, and, and it's the fault that all of us have, so I'm not singling him out. And, and I'm not excluding myself in every instance. So I like to think I'm, I'm pretty objective, but you know, there are times that, that we're not objective, that we just accept something uh, because it fits in with what we already understand. And of course, that's a useful uh, thing to have if we have to evaluate everything um, all the time, you know, in everyday life. I mean, that would be pretty difficult if you're skeptical of every single thing uh, that comes your way, every piece of information, no matter how trivial. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we need confirmation bias in order to function in the world. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, we need to be aware that when we're studying God's word, uh, um, that we're not doing so in a party spirit, because it, it's important for us to follow that. You know, if brothers differ on different points of truth, you know, we need to follow that counsel. And so we do need to evaluate everything that comes to us. We don't just accept things uh, because they agree with us without examining them. But also we don't uh, reject things out of hand just because it doesn't fit in with what we already know. We need to, we need to be open to look at things, to examine our own belief system. And that's not an easy thing to do all the time. So Eugene Pruitt is just demonstrating human nature but but it's unfortunate still that uh you know he he had that attitude and and basically it has to do i, I think a lot of in a sense he's all, i think of him sort of as an adventist apologist because and, and all of us to some degree are we're, we're trying to defend the truths of adventism sometimes from without but also from within and that can create in us this this um, spirit that is is always ready to find fault with something that we're unfamiliar um, instead of to examine it fully. So it's something we have to be really careful about. Okay. This morning of the prophet is supposed to have been accompanied with fasting, not an absolute abstinence from food, but a use of only the plainest and most simple articles of diet. He ate no pleasant bread, no delicacies, nor dainties. He used no flesh nor wine, and he did not anoint his head, which was with the Jews an outward sign of fasting. How long he would have continued this fast had he not received the answer to his prayer, we know not. But his course in continuing it for three full weeks shows that being assured his request was lawful, he was not a person to cease his supplication, 
till the petition was granted. Now, we know that this took place in the first month. So we could have it in the first month of the civil year or the first month of the religious year. Well, it is the, the religious year. Okay. Because when this decree is issued, it's going to be April 23rd, uh, 526, because they're, he's going to issue the decree in, in connection at the end of the 21 days. That's what I understand is is ans- the answer okay. to the prayer. The prayer is that Cyrus now is issuing this decree. That's what Daniel is concerned about. Um, and so the decree is being issued. It's going to take them four months or so uh, of a journey from uh, Babylon to Jerusalem under Cyrus's uh, decree. And so it's probably going to take them about a month to get ready. Um, And then they're going to get there. We know before the first day of the seventh month, because on the first day of the seventh month, they're going to set up an altar. Um, So, you know, maybe they get there in the sixth month. So, yeah, if it was in the fall, then everything's off. So it's, it's in the first month. The other thing is first month is always in the spring they never ever call the seventh month the first month good okay so 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 when when we're dealing with this being from the first day to the 24th day of that first month in the spring of the year yeah it's not from the first day from the first day that thou had said that hard to understand it's not the first day of the month because he's he's going to be the twenty fourth day and it starts, so it's going to be the, the from the fourth to the twenty fourth. Okay, is it the fourth or the third? Since he's saying twenty one days. Twenty one days. So you're going to do an ordinal count. Okay. It's because otherwise you'd call it twenty two days because you're counting the days that you're fasting. So he's going to start on the fourth and end on the twenty fourth. That's twenty one days. Okay, so in a situation like this, we're speaking of this occurring in the spring of the year where normally they would have selected a lamb for the Passover. You would have had the Passover feast. You would have had the Feast of Unleavened Bread and first fruits. Yeah, but they don't so have Dan the was, and they're not observing any of this, right? So, so they, this time they're not keeping the Passover. I mean, he's in Babylonian captivity. There's no temple. There's no priests. Okay. So it's not like he's skipping the Passover that's happening. There's no Passover happening. Okay. Verse 4, 5, 6, 7. And in the fourth and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hedekel, then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. So in this situation, in verse 7, they saw not the vision, but were looking here at the mara, not the mare, and not the calzone. So we are here looking at the third vision, verses 8 and 9. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision. And there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me to, into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then I was in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. By the river Hittichel, the Syriac understands the Euphrates, the Vulgate, Greek, and Arabic, the Tigris, whence Wintel concludes that the prophet had this vision at the place where these rivers unite, as they do 
not far from the Persian Gulf. A most majestic personage visits Daniel on this occasion. Who was it? The description of him is almost parallel to that given of Christ in the Revelation, chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. And the effect of his presence was about such as was experienced by Paul and his companions when the Lord met them on their way to Damascus, Acts 9, 1 through 7. But this was not the Lord, for he is introduced as Michael in verse 13. It must therefore have been an angel, but one of no ordinary character. We therefore inquire what angel will bear the description here given. There are some points of identity between this and other passages which plainly show that this was the angel Gabriel. In chapter 8, 16, Gabriel is introduced by name. His interview with Daniel at that time produced exactly the same effect upon the prophet that is described in the passage before us. And at that time, Gabriel was commanded to make Daniel understand the vision, for he himself promised to make him know what should be in the last end of the indignation. Having given Daniel all the instruction he was able to bear on that that occasion, he subsequently resumed his work and explained another great point in the vision as recorded in chapter 9, verses 20 to 27. Yet we learn from chapter 10 that there were some points still unexplained to the prophet, and he set his heart again with fasting and supplication to understand the matter. A personage now appears whose presence has the same effect upon Daniel as that produced by the presence of Gabriel at the first, and he he tends Daniel, that's more than likely a, a spelling error, Verse 14, where he tells Daniel in verse 14, Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. The very information Gabriel had promised to give in chapter 819. But one conclusion can be drawn from these facts. Daniel was seeking further light on the very vision which Gabriel had been commanded to make him understand. Once already, He had made a special visit to Daniel to give him additional information when he thought it, sought it with prayer and fasting. Now when he is prepared for further instruction and again seeks it in the same manner, in reference to the same subject, can it for a moment be supposed that Gabriel disregarded his instruction, lost sight of his mission, and suffered another angel to undertake the completion of his unfinished work? And the language of verse 14 clearly identifies the speaker with the one who, in the vision of chapter 8, promised to do that work. So, here is Smith. What do we think of his explanation? Well, in in the book Daniel and Revelation, uh, he he actually appends this. uh, It's much shorter paragraphs. One is he changes his view. Uh, because he says the majestic being is actually Christ, so which is good because that's the case, right? So he says we conclude that Christ himself appeared to Daniel. So here he has this long explanation, and, and it's not a very well written paragraph uh, either. But um, um, so he, and so most of this he just says we learn in verse 13 that Michael had come to assist Gabriel in influencing the Persian king. And now to them that he should show himself to Daniel on this occasion. So, um, so that so there's still, especially in this first writing of it, he he seems to miss the whole point because this because we have two things happening here in this chapter. We have the fact that Daniel is still concerned about uh, understanding something, but the question is why. And if we we know that in chapter nine, he wants to know about when are the people going to return to Jerusalem, right? When is when is this promise of Leviticus 26? When is it going to be fulfilled? Because I'm going to visit you and show my good word concerning you to cause you to return again to this place. So he so that would be his main concern and why he's even trying to understand this. 
because he wants to know when is the 70 years over because I'm pretty sure by chapter 10 he knows the 70 years are over and and if they're over when is this promise going to be fulfilled Um, because he knows when he was taken captive and so he knows it's been more than 70 years now since he was taken captive right so 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 you know Smith doesn't really address this point, um, but he but he knows that this there's something happening with the Persian king, and you know Gabriel's there, but it, but it doesn't it doesn't really have, he doesn't really put it together. He doesn't put why is Gabriel influencing the Persian king? How does that have anything to do with the question of this more information? He just says, how natural then that he should show himself to Daniel on this occasion? Well, I don't know if it's natural at all, unless we understand the context of Daniel's prayer. Right. So so there's just pieces of the puzzle missing here in his explanation. But in this longer one, it's even more confusing. Yeah, he's... um... Um, So we know that... So we know that Gabriel is going to be there, as well as Michael. And what he sees in vision is Michael not Gabriel, which which he didn't realize when he first wrote this, but it's going to be corrected in the book. I didn't take the time to go through the 1882 version, and I certainly didn't look at the 1897 version, but I have both. So I'll take a look at those to see exactly how this, how this was originally printed. I have no doubt that by the 1945 revision, that this was corrected. Yeah, well, it was definitely corrected uh, early on. I, I would think it would have been corrected right at the beginning, half, because Ellen White's quite clear about this, that this is the description of Christ, what Daniel sees as Christ. So if he had first published this back in 1870, it would have been corrected before the book was published. In, the book was published in 1882, you said? Correct. It's yeah, so it would have been corrected by then. I don't think that that would have been allowed to be put in the book. Okay. Yeah, it was interesting. But I, I have, have, yeah, I have been having a discussion with the person from England regarding this vision, and I, I can see why people get confused about it. I mean, it's you know, so he thinks that there's you know Christ, there's Gate, there's Gabriel, and there is then, uh, you know, um, Michael. Right? So he thinks Michael isn't Christ, but you know, Michael is is the one that that he sees there in that looking glass vision. It's just his name is given later as Michael instead of as Christ. Correct. So, of the two articles that Smith wrote on Daniel 10. This concludes the first article. Any questions that we have at this point that we have not yet addressed or resolved? No, I think I think with this so far, you know, he's up to verse 14 at this point, right? And I'm just looking at uh, what I have here on my computer. So, so in verse 14, you know, it, it says, so this is just the, the right, because he is, is, or is he addressing verse 14 yet? Is he going to address it later? Because um, right. in, in, uh, in this, nine. it says, uh, so he's just on verse 9, so he hasn't got to verse 14 yet. Okay. So, yeah, so when we get there, there's some important stuff to look at. Okay. Okay, so we will do this. Okay. Here we have Review and Herald on the fourth day of the 10th month published, 27th of December of 1870, Thoughts on the Book of Daniel, verses 10, 11, and 12. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words I speak unto thee, and stand upright for thee, For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, 
For from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. So, Daniel, having fallen into a swoon at the majestic appearance of Gabriel, for so the expression deep sleep of verse 9 is generally understood. The angel approaches and lays his hands upon him to give him assurance and confidence to stand in his presence. He tells Daniel that he is a man greatly beloved. Wonderful declaration. A member of the human family, one of the same race with us, loved not merely in the general sense in which God loved the whole world, when he gave his son to die for them, but loved as an individual, and that greatly. Well might the prophet receive confidence from such a declaration as that to stand even in the presence of Gabriel. He tells him, moreover, that he has come for the purpose of an interview with him, and he wishes him to bring his mind into a proper state to understand his words. Being thus addressed, the holy and beloved prophet, assured, but yet trembling, stood before the heavenly angel. So, as we were just addressing, are we going to agree on this with Smith at this point, that this is Gabriel, or are we looking at a description here of the Savior? Okay, so, um, so obviously we know that this is a description of Christ that he sees. The question is, who touches him? Is it Christ that touches him, or is it Gabriel that touches him? So one of the things we know is that he's going to be touched in uh, 9 verse 21. So 9 verse 21 says, Yea, while I was speak, yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. So he's going to be touched there. And um, and then in chapter 8, I just don't know the verse. Can you hold your thought Maybe for just time. a second? Okay. Uh, I have now opened the 1882 edition, the initial edition of Thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation. And in that book, he continues just as he just did, that this is not Christ, but Gabriel. Okay, well, that's unfortunate that they published it like that. So um, so he's going to edit that later and correct it. You're saying you're saying that he says it's, it's, it's Gabriel that he sees. The verbiage is exactly the same, and the words are exactly the same. So, yes, he is stating that this is Gabriel, not Christ. Okay. 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 So that's interesting. Okay. And then in um, uh, it's going to be Daniel chapter eight, verse eighteen. And now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground. But he touched me and set me upright. So, so I, you know, and I've puzzled over this myself and I haven't come to a conclusion yet so maybe because I haven't looked at all the spirit of prophecy statements on this but it seems to me that it's Gabriel that's touching him in chapter 8 and in chapter 9 and so it, it seems to me that it must be Gabriel touching him in chapter 10 as well I don't know yet um, I haven't come to a conclusion yet on that so Something that we didn't really. My my phone's having some distortion. Really saying, or somebody's saying, whose phone's having distortion? I'm just looking at this. Is my phone okay, Aran? Just noticed your message. It sounds okay right talking. now. Okay. 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 So um, just looking at Kelly's comment. So maybe if people can, if we can figure this out. If if it's, I, I believe it's Gabriel that does these three touches. They're going to happen. But I don't know. Steve, have you looked into this at all? He might be busy. So it's something I have to resolve. But uh, my my guess is that it's, it's Gabriel. 
uh, based on the conversation that's going on. Okay. So Dwight. I'm here. Okay. I was looking at the at the pictures from the chat. Yeah. So my apology, I do find them humorous. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have, you know, in 1010, he's going to be touched. Okay. So that's going to be the first touch. And. Okay. So, it's, so Uriah so Smith says. 10, 10, touch. That's a double one, ain't it? 1010. 10. Yeah. 1010. 10. Well, it's not so much that it's just the doubling, it's also the 10th day of the 10th month symbol, which is when siege occurs. Okay. All right. So, Smith continues. Fear not, Daniel, continues Gabriel. Now, who is it that we find throughout Scripture that says, fear not? Well, there's lots of people that say fear not. Angels say it. This is definitely Gabriel speaking. Okay, such as, I mean, my my the first thought that I have here is that it's always Christ that says fear not. No, well, there's lots of times angels say fear not. Okay, he had no occasion. Pretty, pretty clear. Clear. Yeah, it's pretty clear in the context here that uh, he this person who says fear not is also going to refer to Michael. So, so it's it's Gabriel speaking. Okay. He had no occasion to fear before one, even though a divine being, who had been sent to him because he was greatly beloved, and in answer to his earnest prayer, nor ought the people of God of any age to entertain a servile fear of any of those agents who are sent forth to minister to their salvation. There is, however, a disposition manifested among far too many to allow their minds to conceive of Jesus and his angels as the only stern ministers of justice, inflictors of vengeance and retribution, rather than as beings who are earnestly working for our salvation on account of the pity and love with which they regard us. The presence of an angel, should he appear bodily before them, would strike them with terror. And the thought that Christ is soon to appear and they are to be taken into his presence distresses and alarms them. We commend, we recommend to such just views of the relation which the Christian sustains to Christ, his head, and a little more of that perfect love which casts out all fear. On verse 12, Bagster has the following pointed note. Daniel, as Bishop Newton observes, was now very far advanced in years, for the third year of Cyrus was the 73rd year of his captivity. And being a youth carried when carried captive, he cannot be supposed to have been less than 90. Old as he was, he was set, he set his heart to understand the former revelations which had been made to him, and particularly the vision of the ram and the he-goat, as may be collected from the sequel. And for this purpose, he prayed and fasted three weeks. His fasting and prayers had the desired effect, for the angel was sent to unfold to him those mysteries. And whoever would excel in divine knowledge must imitate Daniel and habituate himself to study, temperance, and devolution. Verse 13. Devolution. Yeah, so, so he's going to quote a Bishop Newton, that's Thomas Newton. Right. Um, which is, is a pretty good commentary on uh, uh, the prophecies. Newton on the prophecies is the book that it comes from. Um, so, so he's going to have, he, Bagster is going to quote Newton. And so that's Uriah Smith quoting Bagster, quoting Newton. Right. <laughs> I don't know why he doesn't just quote Newton himself, but anyway, maybe he doesn't have the book. But yeah, again here, it's, it's got the wrong chronology, right? So 
So this wouldn't have been the 73rd year of his captivity. It would have been the 71st, right? So he would have been taken captive um, in the fall of 607, in the fall of 537. Cyrus comes to the throne with the death of, of Darius the Mede. And it's six months later that Daniel is having this prayer. So, so it would have been his 71st year of his captivity. Okay. Doing some additional checking as we have been talking. 1882 was the first edition of the Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. 1897 was the year of which the copy of Daniel and Revelation was published that is currently on the Ellen White CD-ROM. The copy that is on the Ellen White CD-ROM is in agreement with the 1882 edition. Smith died in 1903. So if we have a a version, a later version of thoughts on Daniel and Revelation that changes the one that touches him from Gabriel to Christ, it likely would have been done after Smith had died, unless there is a version that was published in between 1897 and the time of his death. Yeah, well, I don't think they would have changed it to Christ touching him. I'm pretty sure it's Gabriel. But But I do agree with you. Here it's interesting that we have Bagster quoted by Smith, and Bagster is quoting Bishop Newton. Bishop Newton is different than Sir Isaac Newton? Yeah? Very definitely. Are they? He's a relative, but um, yeah, he's he's a bishop, right? Isaac Newton was never a bishop. Bishop Newton, Thomas Newton. Um, can't remember how he's related to Isaac Newton, but he is. Okay. It, it's pretty clear that it is um, Gabriel that touches him. You know, if you read it, but, you know, and, and definitely it's Gabriel that touches him in chapter nine and chapter eight, the so nine twenty-one and eight eighteen. Right. So it, it, the context would make sense that it's, it's Gabriel. I don't have a spirit of prophecy quote on that. Okay. In that, in that old time video or sermon that I shared the other day, can't remember the guy's name right now, but he, in his personal testimony, a uh, witness of Helen White and of an angel visiting her room at night and seeing the light in the back of the angelic being that was looked like a man but not, uh, testifies that. She heard, he heard Ellen White say to his father, I think, that the angel Gabriel had visited her the night before. So that's a personal testimony, an eyewitness account, I guess a third person account of the angel Gabriel visiting Ellen White. Seems that Gabriel is associated with the giving of prophecies to people. So it would be a good, safe assumption that it is Gabriel here as well, just by relate, by because it's prophecy. Yeah, because it doesn't say it's Gabriel in in chapter ten, but it is Gabriel. I mean that that is pretty clear uh, that Gabriel is the one. Just the whole context of it, and Gabriel is going to be talking about Michael. So obviously, it can't be Christ. Um, you know, some people could argue maybe it's some other angel, but that wouldn't really make sense. Um, so, yeah, it would have to be Gabriel that, that comes. And it's definitely not Michael that's touching him. It's going to be the one that's speaking that touches him. And that would be Gabriel speaking, not Christ, because then Christ would be talking about himself as Michael. Okay, Sanctified Life, page 51.1. So SL 51.1, the paragraph reads, Gabriel now appeared to the prophet and thus addressed him, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. So 
if we take this from Spirit of Prophecy, then that would be in support of what Smith had written in the original articles. Regar regarding what? That it's Gabriel. It's giving you the, the Spirit of Prophecy quotation. That what, what's Gabriel? That it is Gabriel. I mean, we already know. We've accepted that. You, you said that you did not have a direct Spirit of Prophecy quotation. No, so, I didn't have, have a direct Spirit of Prophecy quotation of who's actually touching him. Right. But but we know that it's Gabriel that that he that's going to be doing the talking in chapter ten, and the one that he sees um, that he sees with you know the in linen with the flames and all that that's Christ. So he's going to see Christ. He's going to see Michael, and but Gabriel's going to be the one talking to him, not not Christ. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, so we already knew it's Gabriel. I mean, I knew the Spirit of Prophecy quotes that it's Gabriel in the vision um, that's talking. But but I'm pretty sure that the one talking is the one that touches him. That that's that's just the the point that I did. I don't have a direct statement yet that says you know Gabriel touches him because uh, Ellen White doesn't say that in in my search of it. But uh, I haven't looked at what she says about that chapter particularly as far as the touches. So I, have, I still have to do that study. I'll try to do that before tomorrow. Okay. Now we are now at the close of our time together today. Do we have any other thoughts, questions, or comments? Uh, I have a question that came up it's kind of related because we're talking about michael mm -hmm. my understanding of my understanding of uh okay so let's see that christ even unto the cross that he condescended or descended from the son of god then appeared as an angel michael became michael to speak to the angels and then became man to speak to man is that is that sound am i getting that right no i don't think so uh, michael is just a a term that refers it's it's a challenge who is like god that's what the name means and it's always in controversy with satan so it's actually the context is the great controversy because it's michael who cast satan out of heaven Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. when somebody is trying to usurp God's throne or take the place of God, then it's Michael. And that's why Michael's going to be the one that disputes about the body of Moses in Jude. Right? Is Michael Michael called an angel anywhere? It's... No. No, he's not an angel. Okay. It, it, it's okay. the archangel. Well, the archangel Michael in the New Testament. Uh, is how they translate. It just means the head of the angels or the chief of the angels, the one in command of the angels. So Christ mm -hmm. is the one in command of the angels. So there's no angel that's in command of the angels. It's Christ. Okay. Lucifer was in leader of the angels before that, no. before the rebellion. No. 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 Okay. No. He's just one of the leader of chair. the choir. Okay. So it's, okay. it's Michael, and Michael only exists as a name in context of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. So that's why Michael and okay. his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, right? And then yeah. the dragon is cast out, right? That's in Revelation um, chapter 12, right? Yeah. So anyway, um, that's that's why the name Michael is being used. It's a title, not really a name. Okay. It's a, one of those urban so, legends or myths that I accept it as. Yeah, good. All right. We will return to this portion again tomorrow. So shall we now close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we were able to spend together. We thank you for the lessons that we are learning. 
we ask you to continue guiding and directing our steps. Be with us through this day. Help us in all ways, so that which we do may bring glory to your name and glory to your character. Help us to this end. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.